Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, one of the things that I'm passionate about is taking complex topics in technology and making them more accessible to everyone by putting it in a language that everyone can understand. So if I were to say, hey, let's talk about interoperability in blockchains and the importance of self-sovereign network of blockchains, you could be forgiven for thinking, whoa. But let's take a deep dive together and see what we can learn, because today's guest is Tushar Agarel, and he is the thought leader on DeFi staking and interoperability, And I've invited him on to share his insights on a number of developments in blockchain, including interoperability in blockchains. So he sounds like the perfect guess. And for those of you that don't know, he secured a place on the renowned Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia list in earlier this year for his work in finance and venture capital. And as CEO of Persistence, Tushar is now aiming to bridge the gap between legacy finance and decentralized finance via a a fully interoperable protocol and evolving ecosystem of services that are purpose-built for seamless integration across blockchains. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Bangalore. So a massive warm welcome to the show. So we can speak with Tushar about all this and much more. And what you do. Hi Neil, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, My name is Tushar and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Persistence. Uh, Persistence is a multi-asset protocol in the crypto world that is allowing both retail and institutional folks to trade three main asset classes. So that is uh, proof of stake assets, NFTs, and uh, synthetic commodities. And I'm sure we'll dive into that. But um, a bit about myself. Uh, So... Prior to starting Persistence, I was the first employee at Lunex Ventures, which is the crypto arm of a a traditional venture capital fund based out of Singapore called Golden Gate Ventures. And so I was, as the first employee, did everything from, you know, incorporating the fund to the mission vision of the fund to raising capital and um, investing in a bunch of startups, both on the equity side as well as on the token side. Prior to that, my journey in crypto began hosting a podcast as well called the Crypto Asia, where I would post different kinds of stakeholders, entrepreneurs, fund managers, service providers in the industry. Um, you know, before that, spent four years doing management consulting around the major financial hubs in Asia, so Singapore, Hong Kong mostly, but some of the smaller countries as well. And uh, yeah, originally I come from India, and uh, yeah, uh, it's been you know an interesting journey in terms of, you know, uh, professionally speaking, at least moving from a very sort of corporate environment into into crypto and then within crypto being on the media side, the investment side, and now on the technology side. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to diving into the world of persistence with you in a moment. But before you came on the podcast, I was doing a little bit of research. And I noticed we share something in common, and that is we both interviewed Gary Vaynerchuk. I think we've both told him how he inspired our own journey and and uh, helped get us where we are today. But can you share your origin story, where your passion for tech came from, and ultimately what it was that put you on the path you're on today with everyone listening? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I, uh, you know, just a quick correction there. I've not interviewed him for the podcast. I just met him and got a chance to tell him yeah. how he impacted me. But um, yeah, I mean, high level, I think, you know, I came from India, went to one of the best boarding schools in the uh, in the country and was on this sort of path to, you know, being uh, a high achiever, but a high achiever in sort of the corporate world and you know, running the corporate Rat race. So graduated from university at 21. By 25, I was, you know, making a six-figure salary post taxes, which is, I think, more money than a 25-year-old needs. And you know, especially, you know, five years ago, that was still, you know, making six figures was still, you know, I, I think a decent um, uh, amount of money. Um, but then, you know, I was incredibly lost in terms of what I truly wanted to do. 
I saw what the partners at my consulting firm did or um, you know, some of the other older folks and I basically did not want to end up like them, but I also didn't know what I wanted to do. And that's where I think not just Gary V, but I think a couple of other folks like Tim Ferriss, Naval, um, I think these guys were just, you know, in hindsight, it seems pretty evident and they all have large followings, but you know, I've been following that, their journey for the last, I think, six years now. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, I think, you know, a few of the life principles, I think with Gary, the, it was more about, you know, taking those chances and taking those risks in your twenties, because, you know, basically you're so young that there is no downside, but it becomes very difficult to think like that. Um, you know, especially, you know, while growing up, if your you know, parents never started businesses or things like that. So I think, um, that, um, risk appetite, I always had it, but sometimes you need that bit of a push. So I think that's something that Gary really helped me with. And then the other thing was content creation in general. So, uh, and, and especially in Asia, I think North America people and Europe as well, people do it really well, but in Asia, I think for some reason, you know, there are not that many content creators, especially podcast hosts, even now. Um, and so it's a bit of a oh, blue ocean. And so I, you know, use that to sort of capitalize, build a personal brand, which led to all of the other opportunities, you know, within crypto uh, for me. Uh, with Nabal, it was more about, you know, how do you build leverage into your life? Because, you know, the best companies in the world, the best individuals in the world are highly leveraged up. So what, the, what does that mean? Um, so leverage was in the form of capital media and tech. So hosting a podcast like you do and having, you know, millions of downloads across so many countries, uh, gives you leverage, gives you incredible leverage using media because you have a brand. Um, so for me, it was basically a journey to leverage up on all three aspects. So the podcast was leveraging up on the media aspect, um, uh, Lunex Ventures, the fund was leveraging up on capital and then um, at persistence because we're building technology products, we're leveraged up on tech. So, you know, essentially, and now of course, persistence has capital, persistence as a brand. So we're leveraged up, we're heavily leveraged up on everything. And so, you know, and, and that's what Naval talks about as well. When you get into a position where you're so heavily leveraged up, then your judgment and decisions become everything. Then you're actually not doing work. You're just calling the shots. And, uh, and so I think that was the position that I kind of wanted to put myself in and, uh, yeah. And I think that's what's kind of happened over the last few years as well. But those were the high level sort of mental models that I've followed over the last six years that have helped me, you know, shape and take a lot of decisions. What a great story. And of course, that path led you to persistence and a protocol operating at the confluence of DeFi, NFTs and proof of staking. But but can you tell the, uh, well, can you set the scene and tell the listeners a little bit more about exactly what it is and what makes you different from other solutions out there in this space? Yep. Um, so high level, um, you know, like I said, we're going after three asset classes, which yeah. you highlighted as well. Proof of stake. Um, and, you know, happy to talk about what proof of stake is. Um, second is NFTs, and then the third one being, you know, synthetic commodities. And so, uh, you know, essentially what we're doing is, uh, so there's a lot of um, applications out there that are built on Ethereum. Um, Ethereum obviously has had certain, you know, scalability problems because the transaction fees and things like that are really high. Uh, so what we've done is we've, you know, tried to create this, uh, these applications on a parallel uh, blockchain platform called Tendermint, which a lot of crypto native folks are extremely familiar with. Some of the folks who are not that plugged into crypto may not be, but you know, essentially we're working with technology that has uh, higher throughput, as it's called, which means basically you can process more transactions, um, uh, you know, per second. Uh, ultimately, I think what we're doing differently is more. Our thought process is we want to be at the bleeding edge of, you know, finance and technology. Um, and then over a period of time, just the bleeding edge of tech, you know, for persistence as a whole. So right now we're focused on crypto, but, you know, over a longer, much longer period of time, we'll go after all bleeding edge uh, technology verticals. But within crypto, what we're trying to do 
is stay at the absolute forefront. So a lot of people don't even know about you know staking itself or what proof of stake means. Um, proof of stake itself, you know, academically it's been it's existed for a while, but in production it has only existed. Um, since 2018. So it's extremely, extremely new. I was not early enough in the industry to be a Bitcoin miner or an Ethereum miner, but I was early enough in the industry to be a very early uh, proof of stake asset miner. And um, and so, you know, essentially, you know, what we do at Persistence is try to predict what the future will look like and then try to build products on that. So, um, you know, pr- with proof of stake, what we're doing is because we've been running validators as they're called or miners uh, as they're called for a while we know a lot of the problems that exist within mining of proof of stake assets and now the biggest catalyst is that ethereum itself is moving from you know proof of work to proof of stake consensus mechanism so what we're trying to do is trying to be super early trying to see what problems exist and then trying to solve those problems and those problems can be you know problems that are maybe not problems out in the bigger world but our problems in the crypto world, at least with proof of stake assets. Uh, when we talk about NFTs, I think with NFTs, it's more of a retail play where what you're trying to do is basically, you know, gamify things in terms of, you know, and kind of define. Um, and I think that's kind of happening in real time in terms of like, what does asset ownership mean in the digital world? And um, how do you ascribe value to things, right? Um, if we spend so much time online, um, do physical things even have that much value and should you know digital things have more value and so i think that's kind of you know more on the nft side um i don't want to go into too much technical details in terms of you know the what we're doing differently because i think that will just you know confuse the audience but yeah. kind of high level my goal is to sort of introduce some of the audience members who may not be familiar with what's been happening and bring them kind of up to speed with you know how the world might be evolving. And the final vertical is commodities for us. And our thought process behind that is that if you look at the macroeconomic environment, um, we know with increasing inflation, um, you know, com- commodities have not been sort of relatively speaking that attractive to hold. Um, but uh, what happens in the case of, you know, inflation increasing is that people want to hold People want to hedge and hold real assets. So people want to hold, you know, real estate, gold, Bitcoin, maybe, and commodities um, because they're all hedges. And um, you know, in, in that context, what we're just doing is basically providing access to synthetic commodities like wheat, copper, uh, barley, um, crude oil, um, to folks, uh, to anyone who has a crypto wallet uh, around the world. And uh, because it can be notoriously difficult in certain jurisdictions to get access to these kind of, kinds of products. At high level, I think commodities as an asset class has not been the sexiest asset class, but it is extremely thinly traded, has, doesn't have that high volumes, which makes it sort of the perfect you know, recipe for retail folks to start getting involved. And um, I mean, I'm a true believer that um, you know, the commodity asset class is just you know, one TikTok video away from just booming as a whole. Uh, so yeah, essentially what we're doing is placing bets on these financial products that will be at the absolute bleeding edge of where finance uh, is headed. And keeping it high level there for people outside the industry that want to learn and find out more about this, can you expand on the the interoperability in blockchains and that importance of self-sovereign network of blockchains? Because, again, it's something that people outside the industry probably just won't understand or, or be able to see the value in. Is there any way you can expand on that, just to help people listening understand? Yeah, I mean, I think a good analogy would be just operating systems, right? Today, Android and iOS don't interact with each other. And so you have uh, polarity in terms of, you know, folks going uh, in one of the two directions, typically across all their devices. And, um, you know, I mean, if we kind of zoom out and look at the last sort of few years or decade, um, you know, we had multiple OSs, uh, multiple operating systems, but we kind of, you know, um, ended up with uh, with you know with two, um, 
and and so I think you know something similar is happening in crypto as well, where you have like the quote unquote Ethereum operating system, and then you have the Solana operating system, and then you know Cosmos operating system, and the Polkadot operating system, each of which is like a big blockchain protocol. Um, kind of similar to you can say HTTP, right? HTTP as a protocol. Today we have a universal standard that every uh, web application, web page will use HTTP protocol, the hypertext uh, protocol. So um, what's happening in crypto now is that you have multiple applications that are created on different protocols. Um, the problem then becomes is how do they talk to each other? And that's where the concept of interoperability comes in, where you need applications to speak to one another. And essentially now uh, the industry recognizes that. And what's happening is that a lot of quote unquote bridges are being built so that asset ownership and asset transfer can occur between multiple blockchains. Um, and and that, that's one of the reasons why we decided to build within the Cosmos and Tendermint ecosystem as well, because of their focus on interoperability from the get-go. Um, because our view is that you know, it happens today in the world as well, where you have diehard kind of Android supporters and you have diehard, you know, uh, iOS folks. Um, in the crypto world, the equivalent of that is like Ethereum maximalism, as it's called, where, you know, people think that there should be just one chain to rule them all. Um, our view is that uh, different use cases and different applications need different kinds of blockchains and quote unquote operating systems. And so, entrepreneurs and founders will build applications on platforms based on what the end user requirement is, whether it's optimizing for speed or security uh, uh, and transaction fees. So, you know, based on that, our view, we are not maximalists of any kind. We believe we're interoperability maximalists, where we believe that multiple blockchains will exist in, in harmony and interoperate with each other with you know, assets flowing very freely um, across different platforms. And just to bring to life everything that we're talking about here, do you have any examples or use cases that you can share of of how you're bridging the gap between that, that legacy finance and decentralized finance? Yeah, so, um, you know, high-level speaking, you know, um, as, you know, you and I as retail folks, one, I, I'm presuming you're retail, but you, you could be institutional. But, um, I, you know, for everyday folks, what do they want to do with money? Uh, they, you know, once you have money in the bank, you uh, want to spend that money. You want to, um, you know, save uh, that money or like uh, basically earn interest on that money or speculate, um, which is this whole, you know, um, spend, uh, save, um, you know, invest kind of philosophy that exists. Um, and basically whatever you do, I mean, you do, you interact with sort of the, you know, typically the banking systems or you have fintechs, but fintechs have integrated with banks. And so, you know, that's how you, uh, you know, interact with money on a day-to-day basis. What's happening with crypto is there's a parallel sort of financial ecosystem that is being developed where you can do all of the things that I just described, which is, you know, spend your money on interest, uh, invest. Uh, but it's just happening in a manner where the underlying protocol itself is, and the tooling that is available is sort of open to all, very low barriers to entry and uh, is global in nature. Um, it is, you know, as you know, the terminologies go, it's, you know, permissionless in nature where no one has to seek permission to join this ecosystem. Um, it is trustless in nature in which what that means is that you don't have to trust one single entity to be the escrower of trust um, within the crypto world. So it's just basically creation of a parallel financial ecosystem, but without, with, without some of the you know, issues that exist within the current financial system. Uh, but obviously, you know, crypto and DeFi in and of itself has its own issues um, that folks are, you know, trying to sort through. But from a personal perspective, you know, would I bet on technologists to solve these problems, uh, you know, on a long enough time horizon? Absolutely. And financial services is such a huge industry that 
you know, personally for me, it's super exciting to be in this and go after such a large addressable market. Um, and, and frankly, it's, you know, super exciting. Like, you know, I'm a finance guy, you know, I've been super excited uh, to now work at the you know, confluence of, you know, both finance and tech. And you've done a great job there of simplifying the world of DeFi, NFTs, proof of stake, et cetera, for people outside the industry. So just building on that, could you tell me a little bit more about liquid staking and how to stimulate locked assets? Because, I, again, I think it's a, an area that we don't talk about enough. And I think you do a, a great job of just raising awareness, increasing adoption by just talking about it again in a language that everyone understands. So, um, Neil, I think the, the reality is that I think people don't fully understand staking in the first place. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, you know, explaining liquid staking is even more difficult. Um, so essentially, you know, what is staking? Uh, you know, I'm, you know, a lot of folks in the audience will be familiar with Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum use, use um, a consensus mechanism called proof of work. Uh, today, where you have a bunch of miners that come to consensus on multiple transactions um, and get paid uh, fees for, you know, for doing the work to confirm these transactions. But, you know, as has been printed extensively in the media, um, Bitcoin mining can be, you know, exceptionally harmful for the environment. And so in that context, mm, there's a parallel uh, parallel consensus mechanism called proof of stake that has come about and has gained popularity where uh, the amount of energy that is being spent to come to consensus on transactions uh, is not that heavy. So you don't need massive rooms with servers um, and a lot of heat being generated and a lot of air conditioners to cool those machines down. Um, But it is less, uh, uh, computationally speaking, it's less intensive. And that is proof of stake and Ethereum itself, which is the second largest crypto asset and the largest uh, platform for creating applications today um, is itself transitioning to proof of stake. Now, what does proof of stake mean as the terminology itself suggests? Instead of miners having to do work, um, folks like you and I, if we hold ETH, we can stake that ETH and be part of the consensus mechanism. So we're doing the same work that miners did in the past. And similar to how miners received fees for doing the work that they did, um, today you and I, or once it, ETH transitions to proof of stake, you and I holding ETH can be part, uh, can do what essentially the miners used to do um, using a very simple interface. And so that's where staking, that's what staking is, where you're essentially locking up your assets or staking your assets um, in order to be part of the consensus mechanism and the network pays you fees and that's what that's what leads to um, generation of uh, fixed income yields. Um, now, what happens is now you have staked your ETH and you have uh, given up liquidity on that particular ETH. This is where liquid staking comes about, where what people... People in crypto love liquidity and in general in the financial world, you know, love liquidity. So once you have staked your ETH, you've given up liquidity. What liquid staking does is that we, once you have staked your ETH or other proof of stake assets, what we do is we create a representative token of sorts, which we issue to the person who has staked their ETH. And now this representative token can be used for other purposes, such as, you know, using as collateral for facilitating borrowing lending and things like that. So that is the best I can do in terms of trying to simplify (laughs) what liquid staking is. Uh, that you've done a fantastic job there. And I'm curious, one, one area that we're both passionate about is increasing adoption, bringing more people into this space, bringing more businesses into this space. What do you think is the secret of unlocking mass DeFi adoption? And are you seeing more adoption now? Yeah, so I think one thing is, and this is a bit of a controversial view as well, but yeah. you know, I think going back to the thought about what people do with their money, which is basically spend it, save it, and earn interest, um, or invest that money. Um, even if you look at traditional finance, that is probably just five to ten percent of finance. Ninety percent of finance 
is you know exceptionally complex products that are used by corporations and high net worth individuals to to hedge or to um, basically become wealthier. Uh, and you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. I don't have strong opinions on it. But what the reality is is that. While DeFi is creating this parallel financial ecosystem, which is trustless and permissionless and uh, global in nature, and is helping out retail folks do the exact same things that they do with you know traditional finance products, which is to you know basically spend money, uh, earn interest, and invest. Ninety um, percent of DeFi, in my view, is um, kind of turning into what. 90% of finance and the traditional finance is where you have exceptionally complex products uh, that are being created that maybe less than you know 10,000 people in the world truly understand and can allocate their capital to um, and have the risk appetite of allocating to because in crypto, not only do you have um, you know financial and market risk, but you also have regulatory risk and political risk and smart contract risk. And so I think, you know, from, from that perspective, at least today, or even how the industry is evolving and having created some of these products as well, we know that these products are not being created for like an average retail person, unless the retail individual himself or herself becomes more sophisticated, uh, which is possible as well, because I think, you know, we're going through this massive hyper financialization of the world. Um, and so it is possible that that, you know, the target market for whom a lot of these DeFi products are being created um, expands. But when you say, quote unquote, mass adoption, yeah. I, I think, you know, mass adoption will just happen in the form of, um, you know, folks being able to like send, you know, US dollars or other currencies very, very quickly to anywhere in the world and um, earn higher interest than they what they do right now and be able to invest in, in a bunch of stuff. But that still is like, I think, 10 to 20 percent of what DeFi enables, like 90 um, percent of, I think, the 90 the, percent uh, of, I think, money in crypto is just um, a lot of folks with exceptionally high risk appetite who can afford to take risks. So, but by definition, you know, mass adoption means that you have everyday folks who may not have those risk appetites. So I think that's still a little bit further away and, uh, but it will be interesting to see how it plays out on a longer term horizon. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think if you look at every aspect of our life, nobody knows, nor nobody seems to know now how anything works. <laughs> you know, everything's in, invisible. The, the laptop just works. The phone just works. Our banking just works. We don't question how it works or what goes on under the hood. There's only a select few people that are curious enough to want to find out more. And I think as more solutions are brought forward that make it easier for, for the everyday user, we'll see more and more of that. But uh, as for yourselves, what's next for persistence? Are there any teasers that you can leave your uh, community members that might be yeah. patiently listening through the whole of the episode just to get a, a hint of what's on the horizon? Is there anything you can share? Yeah. So um, uh, the biggest thing is, so we just launched PSIC, which was a, what we call a capped launch because you know we're still undergoing security audits and things like that. Um, so uh, on the product itself. And so we've sort of we're increasing the amount of assets that users can put in on the application uh, slowly. Um, over, a, you know, I think in late September is when we're doing an uncapped launch once all the audits are done for folks to you know, supply capital to this application, um, you know, uh, fully freely. So I think that's the biggest um, thing that I am personally looking forward to. And uh, that will be interesting to see, you know, what kind of, traction we can get with uh, with that with be steak excellent well it's time to have a bit of fun with you now because we started the podcast today talking about your origin story what put you on this path and where you're heading i'm now going to ask mm -hmm. you uh, before you leave us to say 
to answer, what was the soundtrack to your journey in tech? Is there a particular song or piece of music that has inspired you or just accompanied you throughout your career that we can add to our Spotify playlist? Uh, uh, that's a, that's an interesting one. So there's a song by an artist called Kevin Rudolph uh, called I Made It. I'm going to check that out. I've not heard that. I will add that to the to the uh, playlist there. I'm kind of curious, so I will be listening and sharing that with everyone listening. But <laughs> yeah. before I it's, do... uh, it's, it's got a, it's, it's got a bunch of. I mean, it's something I used to listen to as a kid. It's yeah. got a bunch of uh, rappers talking about how they've made it. Um, oh, awesome! And and um, yeah, I mean, I would always kind of uh, you know identify with that song, and you know, listening to that song once you have quote unquote made it. Uh, so it's you know. Uh, yeah love it I'll be listening to that I'll turn it up to 11 but before I let you go for anyone wanting to find out more about Persistence find you online contact your team or even join your community where, where's the best place to start yeah so I think the usual platforms uh, which is you know Twitter and Telegram uh, for the most part for us uh, but yeah we're also active on Reddit and Discord um, and, and but yeah not so much on the traditional channels like facebook or instagram it's mostly where crypto people live (laughs) where crypto people live i love it and i think you've done a fantastic job today of explaining complex subjects which is DeFi, nfts proof of staking etc in a language that everyone can understand i do hope we've um, awoken the curiosity in people that are kind of wanting to find out more and i hope they've learned as much as i have today but more than anything just thank you for joining me thank you neil for having me Hopefully, next time you hear about interoperability in blockchains and the importance of a self-sovereign network of blockchains, you won't be as put off as you were before today's episode. That was the aim. And hopefully you can understand how companies such as Persistence are aiming to bridge the gap between legacy finance and decentralized finance via this fully interoperable protocol and evolving ecosystem. And if you are simply from the Persistence community dropping by for an update, seeing if there was any little teasers offered by Tushar, I hope there was something for you too. But that's it for today's episode. So please keep your messages coming in, techblogwriteroutlook.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn at Neil C. Hughes. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk, where you'll find over 1,700 interviews. But... All that's left for me to say is a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.